Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at part 5 of the Science vs. Evolution series from World Video Bible School. This one is called Do Science Textbooks Prove Evolution? I'll make it really easy for them. They do not. However, the countless hours of research that has gone into collecting and analyzing the data that the textbooks are based on do demonstrate evolution to be the mechanism behind biodiversity. So that's fun. Also, apologies for my squeaky voice. It's a little squeaky. I'm sorry. Let's go. The law of rationality in philosophy says that a person should only draw conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. Nope, it sure doesn't. There is no law of rationality. The main thing that comes up when I search for the law of rationality is the law of rational indices, which states that the intercepts OP, OQ, OR of the natural faces of a crystal form within the unit cell axis A, B, C are inversely proportional to prime integers H, K, and L. I have no idea what this means, but I am quite confident that this is not just a fancy way of saying that a person should only draw conclusions that can be drawn from the evidence. But all that being said, I would agree that when looking at a scientific topic, one should examine the evidence and formulate conclusions that the evidence points to. Evolutionists believe that they have found scientific evidence to support their theory. If it can be shown to be illegitimate, then evolution proves to be an irrational belief. Well then, you've certainly got your work cut out for you, don't you? Between molecular biology, biogeography, homology, embryology, paleontology, phylogenetics, actual observation, and more, there is a boatload of evidence that points to evolution, and it all has to be discredited before we have any reason to start considering other options. If you were to ask an evolutionist, where's the proof for evolution? You're probably going to hear a discussion of some or all of these alleged proofs of evolution that are on the screen. Yes, all of those except embryonic recapitulation are indeed lines of evidence for evolution. Though horse and whale evolution could be combined with fossil evidence to form one category if we're looking at it broadly. But if we're getting specific enough to get into horse and whale evolution, we also have hominid evolution, the reptile mammal transition, and a few others. But I just want to make a prediction now. You see, comparative embryology is an excellent line of evidence for evolution, but it is not the same thing as embryonic recapitulation. Embryonic recapitulation was an idea in the 1800s that an embryo, as it developed, would go through stages that were representative of the adult forms of that organism's evolutionary ancestors. We know now what is actually happening is that the related organisms will have similar embryos during the early stages, but as the embryo develops, the different species embryos will diverge from each other to be more like the adult form of whatever species it is. But creationists love to bring up the fact that Ernst Haeckel, one of the main supporters of recapitulation theory in the late 1800s, fudge some of his embryo drawings to make them look more similar to each other in the later stages than they actually were. He was called out for that almost immediately, but here's the thing. It's possible that Haeckel has been raked through the coals over nothing. A good argument can be made that Haeckel's drawings were not intentionally fudged. He was a marine biologist, not a vertebrate biologist, and a number of his drawings were not from his observation of embryos, but from him copying other people's drawings. Add onto this the limitations of the technology that Haeckel had access to, and it's not hard to imagine him having just done the best that he could to give an honest representation, but just having been mistaken. Biology textbooks typically have several pages devoted to discussing the evidences for evolutionary theories. In the next three sessions, we'll wade through this alleged proof of evolution and see if it passes the science test. Ernst Haeckel called it, Why are creationists so predictable? Like, come on guys, bring something new to the table every now and again. There hasn't been a truly new creationist argument in about 15 years now, and that was their first new argument in the previous 20 to 30 years. You guys have to pick up the pace. German biologist and avid supporter of Charles Darwin popularized the theory now known as embryonic recapitulation. He drew charts like the one shown. Embryonic recapitulation called the biogenetic law by Haeckel, not to be confused with the law of biogenesis, but the biogenetic law. This is the idea that embryos, as they develop in the womb, repeat the evolutionary development of their species. 
which has been shown to be false, which is why it is not used as evidence for evolution. Now maybe move on to how the gill slits in fish share the developmental path with the gill slits in humans. Now I know, this is where creationists will point out that the gill slits become bones that are part of our jaws and inner ears rather than having anything to do with respiration, but they are bones that do not come from the area of the embryo that is responsible for the majority of the bones in our bodies. Instead, it comes from an area that shares a developmental path with the gill slits in fish, like they can trace it back to the first cell that it comes from. Now, there is more to it than that. I go in more depth in my video on embryology, so go check that out if you're curious. My main point here is that comparative embryology is alive and well, and still supporting evolution, even if one of our earliest ideas about it when it was still in its infancy ended up being wrong. Supposedly, there's a period of time when human embryos have gills and tails gill slits, not gills. They never actually develop into gills. They are more properly called pharyngeal arches. And tails, yes, we do develop tails. And as is the case with many vestigial traits, they develop to a certain point in the embryo, and then some genetic switch causes the tail to shrink and be reabsorbed. A similar thing happens with snakes, where they start to develop stubby little arms, but then they are reabsorbed. Same thing happens with horses. They grow all five digits as embryos. Two of them disappear entirely, and another two fuse into the bones that are on the horse's leg, leaving the horse with only one digit by the time it's born. It would be much more efficient for embryos to only develop the structures that are needed for the completed form of the organism, but that's not how evolution works. The problem is that it was shown by scientists to be false decades ago. I'm sorry? It was shown by who to be false? That it was shown by scientists to be false decades ago. Ah, so it was shown by scientists to be false. And yet you claim... Embryonic recapitulation is still taught in many biology classes today. So scientists who learn how to be scientists by going to school and taking science classes, like biology, have proven recapitulation theory wrong, published those results publicly, and then continued to teach it to the next generation of scientists? Does this make any sense to you whatsoever? Why would they handicap new and budding scientists right out of the gate? So according to prominent evolutionists in the more recent past, and according to prominent evolutionist contemporary with Haeckel, Haeckel was wrong. Darwin actually had this one right, so guess whose version is the closest to what actually gets taught in science class today? But yeah, this is an easy target for creationists because there are many, many clues to our evolutionary history that can be found in embryos. So it's a fuzzy line between Haeckel's recapitulation theory and the more accurate idea that embryos of related animals will start off similar and diverge as the embryo develops. And creationists take advantage of the fact that this is a fuzzy line and try and equate the two ideas, and then use the well-supported science that shows recapitulation to be wrong to claim that both are wrong. He not only altered his illustrations of embryos, he even printed the same plate of an embryo three times and labeled one human, one a dog, and the third a rabbit in order to show their similarities. It was actually a dog, a chicken, and a turtle. Not sure why you would change that, it doesn't affect anything, but anywho, Haeckel was challenged on this fact in 1868, and he defended himself by saying that you can't tell the difference between those embryos at that stage. And given the instruments that he would have had available to him at the time, it is entirely possible that he was correct in this. But that doesn't really matter, he had corrected this in his book by the next edition. So he took an ill-advised shortcut and got caught, and then corrected his mistake. But by that point, the damage to his reputation had already been done, and as a result, his name will now go down in history, mostly associated with creationists trying to use his work to disprove evolution, which is only possible by completely mischaracterizing both evolution and a good chunk of Haeckel's work. Haeckel perpetuated a hoax. Even many evolution-friendly biology textbooks admit as much today. You really need to make up your mind, buddy. Which is it? Do we still teach Haeckel's recapitulation theory, or do the textbooks admit that recapitulation theory is not viable? You cannot have it both ways. Those are literally opposite statements. Sadly, in spite of such admissions, biology textbooks still use embryonic recapitulation as proof of evolution. In fact, this statement on the screen is in the section of the book titled Evidence of Evolution. So, wait. This textbook explicitly states that Haeckel fudged his drawings to make them appear more similar than they actually are, something that might not have been intentional but rather a product of a more limited technology of Haeckel's day. But because that sentence happens to be in the Evidence for Evolution section of the textbook, that textbook actually teaches recapitulation theory? Hopefully you clarify this or provide a better quote. 
What about homologous structures? Okay, so no, you're not going to clarify that. So allow me. Textbooks do not still teach recapitulation theory. They do sometimes mention it as something that is wrong, and the one that you just quoted happens to have it in the evidence for evolution section, probably while clarifying the difference between recapitulation theory and the actual embryonic evidence for evolution. But because they're talking about it being wrong in the section that just is labeled evidence of evolution, you take that to mean that they are teaching recapitulation as evidence of evolution. Nice. So, once again, we demonstrate that one side of the creation versus evolution debate has to completely misrepresent the other in order to make their points, while the other side just relies on the actual evidence. Now, if I knew nothing else about an argument other than one side's points rely entirely on a dishonest misrepresentation of their opponent, then just from that information alone, I would tend to side with their opponent. What's that argument all about? Evolutionists argue that many vertebrate species have structures that are constructed from the same basic bones and therefore are similar. No, it's more than just it being the same basic bones. It's also the order in which the bones appear. The entire vertebrate skeletal system, no matter which species of vertebrate you are looking at, has the same order to the bones, even when the bones are quite different. There's also the embryological homologies. There is no reason for horse embryos to have five digits if they did not descend from pentadactyl ancestors. There's no reason for snake embryos to grow legs. There's no reason for human embryos to grow tails. There's also the concept of analogous traits, traits that serve the same function but are evolutionarily independent. We don't just look for traits that appear similar, declare them homologous, and then move on as if we've accomplished something. The label of homologous or analogous only gets applied after the traits have been rigorously studied and determined to either be the result of an evolutionary relationship or have arisen independently. A good example of an analogous structure is the tympanic membrane in birds. It works the same way as ours and is very superficially similar, but there is good evidence that the tympanic membrane of the birds evolved independently from our own tympanic membrane. This is also a demonstration of the fact that we don't just give similar structures the same names and then use the fact that they are named the same thing as evidence for evolution. Bird and mammal tympanic membranes share a name, but do not share an evolutionary history. Because of this similarity, they argue, as does this biology textbook, that homologous structures provide strong evidence that all four-limbed vertebrates have descended with modifications from common ancestors. So similar looking anatomical structures, according to evolutionists, are strong evidence that we share a common ancestry with whales and frogs. Yes, because descent with modification is the name of the game. You could, through small modifications in each generation, move from a human skeleton to a frog skeleton or a whale skeleton. You wouldn't need to change the order of the bones, just change their shape slightly with every generation. Now, of course, I am not suggesting that humans are going to evolve into frogs or whales anytime in the future, but since we share a common ancestor with both frogs and whales, it stands to reason that the body plans will be somewhat similar. And they are. More than somewhat, in fact. They're pretty much identical. First of all, it's important to realize that creationists don't deny that similarities exist between different creatures. Creationists don't deny the evidence, there's no need to. While I do not deny that you don't deny that there are similarities between creatures, you did spend the first seven minutes of this video in denial mode with the embryology thing. If there were no need to deny the evidence, then there would be no need to bring up recapitulation theory when talking about embryology, because that's not where anyone thinks the evidence points. It always harmonizes with the true creation model. The problem isn't the evidence, it's the interpretation by evolutionists of that evidence. While the evolutionist says that similarities prove a common ancestor, the creationist says that commonalities prove a common designer. So what? God was too lazy to design a back that is actually meant for bipedal walking instead of choosing to reuse his old design in a way that guarantees us back problems in later life? God couldn't be bothered to remove all of the unnecessary bones from our feet, instead reusing the layout of the foot that he had used before that also causes problems? Sure, you can point to homology and declare that this is the result of a common designer, but it makes your designer look sloppy and deceptive. And yeah, deceptive, because when you arrange organisms by their homologous structures, it ends up being a phylogeny that shows evolutionary relationships. So your designer was not only too lazy to make proper designs for their purposes from scratch, he also designed in a way that made the organisms look like they evolved rather than being designed. In the same way, when God designed the lung to be suitable for life on Earth, 
one would expect a very similar design to be used in other beings that would be living contemporaneously on the same planet and in the same relative environment. Yes, God gave us all lungs because we have to breathe the same air. Except fish need to do their gas exchanging in the water, so they get gills to take advantage of the oxygen in the water. But then there are the water-dwelling creatures who spend the vast majority of their time underwater, but have lungs like the surface dwellers. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to give whales and dolphins respiratory systems designed for breathing air. The idea that a creature that spends its entire life living in the water could potentially die of drowning just seems silly to me, especially considering the fact that gills exist. And there are other types of respiratory systems too. Some organisms breathe through their skin. Others have a tracheal system that's a bunch of tubes down their abdomens. And if you organize all these animals by their type of respiratory system, you find them in distinct categories, which also share other characteristics. And when you arrange them by the other characteristics that they share, the groupings are the same, almost like they evolved. In truth, when examined closely, the evolutionist homology argument quickly starts to break down and inconsistencies arise. For instance, humans share very similar analogous structures with several creatures. Human structures uh, share similarities with the octopus eye, the pig heart, the, the Pekingese dog's face, the milk of a donkey, and the pronator quadratus muscle of the Japanese salamander. But evolutionists would hardly deem these creatures relatives of man. Quite the contrary. In fact, if you look at the animals that you showed, the ones that we have the closest relationship to, the other mammals, are the ones that we share the most characteristics with. You are correct that the octopus eye is analogous rather than homologous. Octopuses actually have better eyes than we do, but there's not a whole lot of commonality between the octopus and the humans. The lizard, though, that is definitely not as similar to humans as the three mammals that you have there, but it is a lot more similar to humans than the octopus. It's a tetrapod vertebrate. So if you arrange these animals by our similarities, you get the same arrangement as when you arrange them by our evolutionary relationship. Even certain plants in the crustacean Daphnia have hemoglobin, as do humans. Yes, plants have hemoglobin. Fun fact, plant hemoglobin is what is used in plant-based meat substitutes to give the meat the look and feel of being rare, so a veggie steak will still bleed when you cut it. And tracing the lineage of hemoglobin is one way that we study evolution. And just to add to the list of practical benefits of studying evolution, the study of the evolution of hemoglobin has led to the treatment of hemoglobinopathies through the modulation of globin gene expression. Are these close relations of man? Not a close relation, no. And that's why their hemoglobin is a different structure from ours. That's convergent evolution. And another inconsistency, if similarity proves common ancestry, then shouldn't dissimilarity prove no common ancestry? No, not at all. You see, it's not just about the similarities, it's about the pattern of similarities and differences. You won't find a frog with fur because only mammals grow fur. You won't find a dog with feathers because only dinosaurs grow feathers. You won't find an earthworm with a backbone because only vertebrates have backbones. And the more of these traits that you compare, the more clear the picture of the evolutionary tree of life becomes. And then we find that evolutionary trees that are constructed using completely independent methods result in identical trees within a reasonable margin for error. If everything were designed, that designer went to a lot of trouble to make everything appear related. There's more dissimilarities between humans and other animals than there are similarities. That depends very much on which other animals you're talking about. Chimps and humans probably have more in common than you'd care to admit, but yeah, we are quite different from octopuses. So the homology argument only works when you pick and choose. In truth, it makes more sense that there was a common designer of these creatures who used certain structural features several times in many different creatures due to the fact that these anatomical structures deal uh, are ideal for life in similar environments on this same planet. So for whales and dolphins, air-breathing lungs were the ideal method of gas exchange? Your god wasn't creative enough to come up with some sort of hybrid system that would allow them to breathe both air and water? Oh, but wait, he did, because labyrinth fish are a thing. You know those fish that have both a gill system and a labyrinth organ that allows them to breathe air? So God was creative enough to design a system like that, he just couldn't figure out how to scale it up? And it just so happens that the only marine creatures to have mammal-style hair also happen to be the ones with lungs, and who feed their offspring with milk. 
etc. We don't just find something that is similar, declare it to be the result of evolution, and call it a day. It's about the pattern of similarities and differences. The homology argument can hardly be used as solid evidence for evolution when structural similarities can easily be interpreted in another way, a way that doesn't contain inconsistencies and therefore is more in line with the evidence. There are far fewer inconsistencies in the evolutionary interpretation than in the young earth creationist interpretation. You haven't even successfully pointed out one inconsistency yet. And yet, I can bring up the issues with the bad design that can be found all over the natural world. But your designer is supposed to be perfect. The only way the inconsistencies can be removed from the creationist interpretation is if your designer was sloppy, lazy, deceptive, and at times counterproductive. If that's a picture of God that you're okay with, then sure, go ahead and continue insisting that there are no inconsistencies in your interpretation. What about genetic similarities? Haven't scientists discovered that human DNA is like 98 to 99% identical to chimpanzee DNA? That depends very much on how you are calculating the similarity, because it's not as cut and dry as just sequencing the two genomes and then doing a letter by letter comparison. What happens if a large section of genetic material is duplicated in one species, but not in the other? Does that count as one change or thousands of changes? What about the fusion of chromosome two? Was that one change or millions? The 99% number was arrived at by excluding the 1.3 billion bases that were part of these large changes like this from their calculations. But it's not how high the percentage similarity is between two species that determines their relationship. In the case of molecular biology, we can actually construct phylogenies based on single genes. That is, we examine the same gene in several species, compare the similarities and differences, and build a tree of relationships between the different variants of the genes based on a rigorous statistical analysis of sometimes thousands of potential trees. We will then use this data to figure out the lineage of this gene. We can then do this with multiple other genes and endogenous retroviruses, and there is a very high level of agreement between all the different phylogenies that are arrived at through independent methods. This is indicative of actual relationships rather than just the appearance of relationship. There is no reason that analyses of several different genes should independently result in matching phylogenies if they are not actually related. Now I'm skipping over a bit here as he gives a long-winded intro to a quote from a geneticist that points out that because in DNA sequences there are only four base pairs to choose from, two completely unrelated DNA sequences would be expected to have about 25% similarity just from random chance alone, which by itself has some significant problems that I'm sure are dealt with in the book that this number is being pulled from, but I just wanted to give you that statement as context for what comes next. So using the same DNA comparisons that are used to compare chimps and humans, a daffodil is 25% human genetically. I would like to see your source for that, because using the same methods that got us the 99% number for chimps and humans, I would expect the daffodil number to be somewhere around the 50-60% to 60 mark, roughly the same as bananas. Because one of the issues with the 25% similar in unrelated to genetic sequences number is that it ignores similarity of sequences. One in four base pairs should match up, but there should not be long stretches of identical bases. The long stretches of identical bases are most likely for genes that code some of the most basic cellular functions that are shared between plants and animals. But it's actually pretty hard to find a reputable source that puts percentages on the genetic similarities that we have with other organisms. It's usually pop science sites that are trying to balance the line between being sensationalist enough to get clicks and being accurate. The first page that comes up for a search on this topic is an article by Business Insider. Surely, when looking for accurate information on evolutionary genetics, Business Insider should be your go-to source. Actual scientific publications usually avoid pinning specific numbers on our genetic similarities with other organisms in such simplistic terms, because the scientists that are doing that work understand that it is a lot more complicated than a simple percentage would indicate. Looking at the 2005 study that many popular science publications cited as their source for the 96% similarity with chimps number, I can't even be sure that I found where in that study the number originates. It looks like it might be from this section on insertions and deletions, where they say that the Indel difference corresponds to approximately 3% of both genomes, but 96 as a percentage only shows up once in the entire paper with reference to how short covered insertions are. 96% of them are shorter than 20 base pairs. I'm not sure what a covered insertion is, but it is definitely not total percentage difference between the genomes. 
4% shows up as how many genes have a faster than expected neutral substitution rate. So that's not the total difference between genomes either. So yeah, the only thing I can think of is that some pop science writer saw that approximately 3% difference in insertions and deletions, rounded it up to 4%, drew the erroneous conclusion that this is the total percentage difference between the genomes, and wrote an article about how we are 96% similar and then was copied by other pop science writers a bunch of times. So these percentage similarity numbers are an excellent example of bad science journalism, nothing more. Now, seemingly as this kind of realization about the genetic code is becoming more and more widespread, and as more research is conducted, some geneticists have begun to slowly move away from the argument that chimps are 98 to 99 percent human and therefore share a common ancestor. No, it's not that geneticists are moving away from genetic similarities as an argument. It's that more people are learning the accurate science that is behind these inaccurate numbers, and pop science publications are starting to catch up. If you read the actual papers behind the pop science articles, you'll see that geneticists never have been using our percentage similarity with chimps as evidence for common ancestry. They have, however, found several independent lines of evidence for common ancestry while examining and comparing various genomes, but they are based on creating genetic phylogenies rather than just saying, a herp derp, these two are 99% and these two are 90%. They seem to pick and choose what results they'll highlight based on what appears to support their theory. Projection much? There are often raging debates in scientific publications. One that I recall seeing recently was a paper that used a revised generational time in chimps, applied that to molecular clock dating, and ended up with a divergence between humans and chimps that fit in with what we expect, evolutionarily speaking. Within months of publication, there was a scathing letter published that heavily criticized this paper's methodology. And then the original authors responded with their own letter. And then there was a reply to that one. And it keeps going for quite a bit. If geneticists are only presenting evidence that supports what they already believe about evolution, why was there heavy criticism leveled against a paper that came to the expected evolutionary conclusion? Stuff like this happens all the time, and that does not match up with your claim here. Consider another factor which doesn't support their theory. DNA, the fundamental blueprint of life, is squeezed closely into chromosomes, and all cells with a nucleus have a specific number of chromosomes. If humans and chimpanzees were so close genetically and share a common ancestor, then wouldn't common sense tell us that we should, at the very least, expect them to have the same number of chromosomes in their cells? Why, yes, of course. That's obvious. But chimps have one more pair of chromosomes than humans! <gasps> okay, now I've watched ahead. He doesn't actually address the answer to this that I'm sure most of you are already at least partially familiar with. So here we go. Chromosomes have a specific structure. In the center is a centromere, which plays a few key roles, most notably in cell division, and has a recognizable genetic sequence. At both ends of the chromosome, we find the telomeres, which are simple repeating patterns of DNA that also serve a few functions, such as the maintenance of the ends of the chromosomes. In fact, in great apes, the telomeres are always the sequence TTAGGG, repeated from 500 to 3500 times. These are two chromosomal structures that are easy to recognize. So chimps have one more pair of chromosomes than humans do, and yet we consider chimps to be our closest living relatives. So what happened to the extra pair of chromosomes? Well, if we look at chromosome 2, we find that it not only has a telomere in its middle, it actually has a pre-telomeric sequence followed by a telomeric sequence, followed by an inverted telomeric sequence, followed by an inverted pre-telomeric sequence, right in its middle, as if the bottom of two chromosomes just got stuck together. Now, if this were the case, you would expect to find two centromere sequences. And you do. The actual centromere of the chromosome, and a second non-functional centromere, and they're both separated by the telomeric sequence that I mentioned earlier that's right in the middle of the chromosome. Consider this. A strict comparison of chromosome numbers would indicate that humans are more closely related to the Chinese muntjac a small deer found in Taiwan's mountainous regions, than to a chimp, because the muntjac has 46 chromosomes, just like man. And a chimp would be most closely related to the tobacco plant, which has 48 chromosomes like the chimp. It's a good thing that we're not just counting the numbers of chromosomes to determine relatedness, then. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, but what is contained in those chromosomes is more important when determining relationships than how many of those chromosomes there are. 
Clearly, genetic similarities or dissimilarities in no way prove a common ancestry. The number of chromosomes is not a measure of genetic similarity or dissimilarity. To my knowledge, it has never been used as such. And I think that's where I'll leave it for today. I guess this one's going to be another two-parter. Today's comment of the day comes to us from DC Wilson, who says, Creationist. Evolution means any animal species should suddenly give birth to any other animal species, regardless of how different they are. This was on one of the other videos in this series, and yeah, not to spoil anything, but in the second half of the video that I covered today, he brings up X-Men unironically. It's amazing. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the wooden plates that keep me printing fudged embryo drawings. If you'd like to enable my fraudulent activity, you can support the channel for as little as $1 per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time! 